Hello and just hello everyone. Welcome to class 12 biology. In this video, we will discuss the last topic of the chapter that is DNA fingerprinting. So DNA fingerprinting, uh, the method was developed in late 1984 by Sir Alec Jeffries. So Sir Alec Jeffries over here, he developed the DNA fingerprinting method. So what he realized was that the DNA variations among individuals can be helpful in creating DNA profiles. So a DNA profile of a particular individual is unique for that individual. Just like our fingerprint is unique for each and every individual, DNA profile is also unique for each and every individual. So this DNA fingerprinting or DNA profiling was the method developed by Sir Alec Jeffries in 1984. So what is DNA fingerprinting useful for? So in which situations can we use DNA fingerprinting? So uses of DNA fingerprinting, DNA fingerprinting can be useful in crime investigations. In forensic science, we can uh, use DNA fingerprinting in solving crimes, crime cases. So let's say we have a crime scene over here. So normally what we do is we look for the murder weapon and on the murder weapon, we look for physical fingerprints. So by chance, if we don't find the murder weapon, right? If, Instead, we find biological samples like blood. So what we can do is we can create DNA fingerprints of the uh, biological samples. And we can match those DNA fingerprints with the suspects and we can solve the crime. Right? So DNA fingerprinting is useful in solving crime or in crime investigations. In another situation where there can be a paternity dispute, like where two, main, two men are trying to claim the baby, uh, claim themselves as the, as the father of the baby, what doctors can do is the, the doctors can create a DNA fingerprint of the fetus and match the DNA fingerprint with these two males and determine who is the real father. So in paternity tests also, uh, fingerprinting, DNA fingerprinting can be useful. So these are the uses of DNA fingerprint and also in different cases we can use DNA fingerprinting like in wildlife science as well. In species determination and everything we can use DNA fingerprinting but in our textbook it is given that DNA fingerprinting is used is useful in forensic science right in crime investigation and in paternity tests so before we start discussing about the DNA fingerprinting method we need to understand some basic genetic concepts so let us revisit what we have studied while we studied about human genome projects I told you that if we have a long DNA a molecule a lengthy DNA molecule in this DNA molecule we have regions which can code for different types of RNAs and which can code for proteins and those regions are called as genes the uh, the unit of inheritance right the unit of inheritance is called as genes right so these genes they code for proteins or they can code for different RNAs whereas a large portion of this DNA, a very large portion of this DNA, they are non-coding DNA regions. They do not code for any proteins. Right? So these are not genes. These are non-coding regions. Now in these non-coding regions, we have uh, small, small areas where there are repetitive DNA sequences. So repetitive DNA sequences are those DNA sequences where in a small stretch of DNA is repeated many times. If we look at this particular repetitive DNA sequence, we can see that a small stretch of DNA, ATGC, it repeats many times over here. ATGC, it repeats how many times? It repeats five times over here, right? So over here, you can also see that this particular small stretch of DNA, it repeats four times over here, GATTC, GATTCC, GATTCC, like that. So it repeats, right? So these are called as repetitive DNA sequences. So in the non-coding region of the DNA, we can find we can find the repetitive DNA sequences, and these repetitive DNA sequences, which uh, which are also called as satellite DNA, these repetitive sequences can be separated from the bulk DNA, the other regions of the DNA, by using density gradient centrifugation. So density gradient centrifugation is a separation method, uh, which we use for the separation of satellite DNA or the repetitive DNA sequences from the bulk DNA. Okay, so if you observe in these repetitive DNA sequences, we can see that the number of nucleotides in the repeating sequence, right, the number of nucleotides in the repeating sequence is variable. 
So over here we can find that in this repeating sequence we have ATGC that means four nucleotides whereas in this particular repetitive sequence we have GATTCC which means they, they have got six nucleotides and in this one we have got only two nucleotides. So the number of nucleotides in the uh, repetitive DNA sequence is variable. Okay, so uh, that is about the repetitive DNA sequences. Now let us talk more about the satellite DNA. So satellite DNA, which are the repetitive DNA sequences, can be categorized into two groups based upon base composition, means uh, adenine, thymine, and guanine cytosine components composition, and length of the segment based upon length of the segment and based upon the copy number. The satellite DNA there are two. They are of two types mini satellites and micro satellites mini satellites are those repetitive dna sequences in which the repeating sequence is of more than nine nucleotides if the repeating sequence contains more than nine nucleotides then it is called as uh, mini satellite whereas in micro satellite the repeating sequence is of one to eight nucleotides long okay so that is they are called as micro satellites uh, since these are small repeating sequences they are also called as short tandem repeats STRs right microsatellites are also referred to as short tandem repeats or STRs so I hope you are clear about the differences between mini satellites and microsatellites this is pretty important because in DNA fingerprinting method we will use the mini satellite both of them are commonly referred to as VNTRs so VNTRs or variable number of tandem repeats they are nothing but mini satellites and microsatellites okay so these satellite DNAs, right, these sequences or these uh, repetitive DNA sequences, they show high degree of polymorphism and it forms the basis of DNA fingerprinting, right. So in DNA fingerprinting, what we do is we don't sequence the DNA of uh, the entire DNA of the individuals, right. What we do is we take these repetitive DNA sequences and then we create a DNA profile and match. Uh, in DNA fingerprinting method okay so the high degree of polymorphism in the satellite DNA which means the satellite DNA or the repetitive DNA sequence is variable from individual to individual right so uh, high degree of polymorphism it's the basis of DNA fingerprinting method now let us try to understand the term polymorphism in detail so polymorphism means variations at genetic level so the variation at genetic level is called as polymorphism at, at genetic level by genetic level may we mean variation at DNA level and the variation at DNA level can be created by mutations so we can say that polymorphism is created due to mutations so over here let's try to take a segment of DNA a DNA sequence ATGC ATGC right so we have ATGC which repeats twice over here okay so this is one morph this is one morph this is the original morph and let's say there is some mutation a point mutation in which the adenine is substituted by thymine when the adenine is substituted by thymine now we get a different dna uh, sequence atgc now ttgc so this becomes a little bit different over here right this is another morph and in another case let's say there is duplication of the entire repeating sequence that is ATGC which is duplicated again ATGC and creates an extra ATGC sequence over here right and this is another morph so these kind of you know, mutations can lead to genetic uh, variation and that is called as polymorphism right and if the mutations become inheritable if the mutations which have occurred in the original individual becomes inheritable if this particular mutation is passed down to the next generation or if this particular mutation is passed on to the next generation then what will happen uh, inside the population the frequency of this particular mutation will start to increase so when the mutations or the inheritable mutations are found in a population at higher frequency then it is called as DNA polymorphism okay so but we have to think about when will be a mutation inheritable how will mutation become inheritable if a mutation occurs in my skin cell this won't become inheritable it won't be passed down to my children but if the mutation occurs in my germ cells or the cells which give rise to my gametes right so then only 
the mutations will become inheritable. So for the mutations to become inheritable, the mutation has to occur at the germ cell, in the germ cell, okay. And then only the mutation will be passed on from generation to generation. So inheritable mutations, right, if they are found in a population at high frequency, then it is called as DNA polymorphism. And such variations, such variations in the DNA sequence are very common in non-coding regions of the DNA. The non-coding regions of the DNA in which the repetitive DNA sequences are present, right. So in those sequences, in those repetitive sequences or in those regions of the DNA which are non-coding, the variations or the DNA polymorphism is uh, more common. Why? Because mutations in the non-coding region of the DNA will not create any effect in the individual. Any phenotypic effect won't be observable in mutations created in non-coding regions of the DNA. So therefore, there are higher chances that the, uh, the mutations can be passed down from generation to generation. Now imagine if a mutation occurs at a coding region, what will happen if the mutation occurs at the coding region, it will affect the phenotype. And the phenotypic change can be uh, either positive or it can have negative effect. So if it, is a, it has got negative effect, the individual will be removed from the population through natural selection, right. But these kinds of mutations which occur in non-coding region, since it does not affect the survival capability of the individual, right, therefore these mutations, they are passed on from generation to generation and they become more common, okay. So uh, such variations of uh, in the DNA sequences are more common in non-coding region. I hope you got the logic, okay. So now since we have understood uh, different genetic uh, concepts, uh, now let us get back to the DNA fingerprinting method. So the DNA fingerprinting method which was developed by Sir Alec Jeffries, it used VNTRs. I told you what is VNTRs, right? In VNTRs, he used specifically mini satellites, okay, which shows high degree of polymorphism. Right? Now this sentence will start to make sense because you have you now know what, what are VNTRs, what are mini satellites and what, what do you mean by polymorphism. So Sir Alec Jeffries, he used mini satellite DNAs for in DNA fingerprinting method. And he used these uh, mini satellites in DNA fingerprinting method because he knew that there is high degree of polymorphism in that. Okay, so let us try to understand this one further. These VNTRs or the mini satellites, they vary or they differ in their copy numbers. Copy number means number of times the sequence repeats. Okay, so in this particular picture, we have individual A, right? This bald individual, individual A, on his chromosome number seven. So these are two homologous chromosomes, chromosome number seven, one from the father and one from the mother. And on chromosome number seven, we have these repeating sequence over here. The red boxes represent the repetitive sequence, the repeating, the repeating DNA sequence. And on individual B, on the same seventh chromosome, right, the seventh chromosome of this individual B, he also have got uh, mini satellites or repetitive DNA sequences over here in the red boxes. Now, if you compare, the number of uh, times the sequence repeats itself, you can see over here that in chromosome number seven of the individual A, we can see that on one chromosome, the copy number is three, that means uh, the sequence repeats three times. And chromosome number two over here, the second chromosome, the one from the father, it, it has got copy number four. And in individual number B, the copy number is 11, and copy number is 9, 11 and 9 in individual B. So this is the kind of variation that uh, we are talking about, the polymorphism in VNTRs. So this is called as variable number of tandem repeats. So Sir Alec Jeffries, he used this particular thing for creating different DNA profiles. Now let us discuss about the steps in DNA fingerprinting method. Right. So the DNA fingerprinting method, it is a sudden blotting technique. Right. You will study about sudden blotting technique in your higher classes. Uh, in, in the steps in DNA fingerprinting method, what we need to do is, in the first step, if we find a biological sample, so let's say we are trying to solve a crime, and if we find a biological sample over there, uh, like a skin cell or blood cells, what we, in, the in the first step, what we need to do is, we need to take the DNA out of the cell. So that is called as isolation of the DNA. Right. Just like in Human Genome Project, 
uh, first what we need to do is we need to isolate the DNA from the cell by first removing the cell membrane then we have to remove the nuclear membrane then we have to uh, remove the uh, impurities like other uh, biomolecules like proteins um, RNAs should be removed and then we have to get the pure uh, DNA so the first step is isolation of the DNA okay so that we get a pure DNA molecule so after getting the DNA molecule after isolating the DNA from the cell the second step is digestion of DNA by restriction endonucleases so what does this particular sentence mean digestion of DNA by restriction endonuclease now what we have got after we have isolated the pure DNA from the cell we have now a very long DNA molecule so this long DNA molecule it needs to be broken down into small small fragments and the enzyme which is uh, required for breaking the DNA molecule is called as restriction endonucleases so if we have the, these two DNA over here right these two DNA and if we need to digest the DNA if we need to cut the DNA into small small fragments what we use is we use specialized molecular scissors known as restriction endonucleases so these restriction endonucleases they can cut the DNA at specific locations right these restriction endonucleases they can cut the DNA at specific locations thereby creating small small DNA fragments right so this is the second step right, in which we treat the DNA molecule with restriction endonucleases the restriction endonucleases will cut the DNA into small fragments after the DNA has been cut into small fragments what we need to do is in the third step we need to separate the DNA fragments by gel electrophoresis method so gel electrophoresis method is a separation method right a separation technique where wherein we separate the DNA fragments based upon their molecular size okay the fragment size so the gel electrophoresis setup looks something like this okay so we have the gel Right. it is agarose gel agarose is a polysaccharide you might have studied that in your class 11 so on this agarose gel we have wells or small holes over here in which we load the dna uh, fragments right the the dna fragment mixture we load them into the wells and after loading what we can do is we can switch on the power source and when we switch on the power source we create an electric field and since the DNA molecules are negatively charged, since the DNA molecules are negatively charged, they tend to move towards the positive end or towards the anode. So the DNA moves through the gel towards the positive charge, that is towards the anode. Why? Because DNA is negatively charged. Right? Now what happens over here is, when the DNA starts to move, the smaller DNA or the smaller DNA fragments, they tend to move further than the larger DNA. Right. So the largest DNA will remain behind whereas the smaller DNAs or the smallest DNA will move the furthest and the smaller DNA they will move further from the larger DNA. Right. So based upon the molecular size or based upon the fragment length of the DNA, the DNA will be separated into these bands. Right. So this is the third step that is separation of DNA fragments by gel electrophoresis. Right. Okay. So next step on step number four after the DNA has been separated uh, in gel electrophoresis what we need to do is we need to transfer the DNA fragments from gel to other synthetic medium like nitrocellulose membrane or nylon why we are doing this is because the gel or the agarose gel it is very delicate and it can get damaged so we can lose the DNA right so in order to prevent that what we need to do is we need to uh, transfer the DNA to a more solid uh, membrane like nitrocellulose membrane or nylon okay so how do we do that from this uh, gel agarose gel on which the DNA has been separated according to its molecular length or the fragment length we just transfer that to the uh, nitrocellulose membrane just like blotting so that is why it is called a sudden blotting when we have ink over here if we take a blotting paper if we put it over here what happens the ink gets transferred to the blotting paper right so just like that if we put nitrocellulose membrane near the uh, or over the uh, agarose gel the dna will get transferred to the nitrocellulose membrane so that is why it is called as sudden blotting technique so the blotting in the word makes sense over here so now the the, uh, the dna has been transferred to the nitrocellulose membrane or to the nylon membrane in step four so next step 
Next step, what we have to do is we have to hybridize the DNA which has been separated on the gel with uh, labeled VNTR probe. So this label can be anything. This uh, VNTR probe, so variable number of tandem repeats, the pre-prepared variable number of tandem repeats or repetitive sequences are there, which is radio labeled or which can be fluorescent labeled. Right? So these VNTR probes are nothing but short segments of repetitive DNAs which are radio labeled. So let's go with radio label. So on this gel, we have separated the DNA based upon their uh, fragment size, right? So now we don't know which are the mini satellites. We don't know which are the repetitive DNA over here. So among these bands, we don't know where the repetitive DNA sequences are. So in order to know that, what we need to do is we need to put VNTR probes, radio labeled VNTR probes. So when we put VNTR probes based upon base complementarity, they will form hybrids. They will form hybrids. So VNTR probes will go and bind with the VNTR probe, VNTR present over here. So it will form uh, hybrids and the hybrids will be visible like this. Right? So this VNTR probe has gone and hybridized with this uh, VNTR and now we can see over here. Right? And same one VNTR is over here. Right? So this is called as hybridization or using labeled. So this labeling is, uh, this VNTR probes are labeled with uh, radioactive substances okay so in sixth step now we have to visualize actually you won't be able to see the DNA even after uh, VNTR probe has been labeled uh, the labeled VNTR probes has been hybridized right so after that what we need to do is we have to detect the hybridized DNA fragments by auto radiography in auto radiography what we need to do is we need to take an x-ray sheet an x-ray sheet and put it over the uh, nitrocellulose membrane and since the VNTR probe has been already been hybridized uh, the radioactivity will form these bands right it can form an image on the x-ray x-ray film right and on the x-ray film we can see the uh, VNTRs and this VNTR image will form the DNA profile of the particular individual okay so that is the steps involved in DNA fingerprinting now we have one extra step Right, one extra step just imagine right just imagine if we have very small sample if we have very small sample let's say we found just a hair follicle at the crime scene right and if we have to extract the DNA from very less amount of cell we, we will get very less amount of uh, DNA molecules so if we get very less DNA molecules the DNA fingerprinting method may not be that sensitive or it may not show uh, uh, very bright or very visible bands on the nitrocellulose on, on the gel membrane. Now, in order to increase the sensitivity, what we need to do is we need to amplify or increase the DNA number. Right? So, when, when, when we have to increase the DNA amount, we follow a procedure known as PCR, short for polymerase chain reaction. Right? So, we use PCR to increase the DNA amount. So over here you can see by using PCR technique or PCR reactors, we, we can increase the DNA number. So if here we have, we, let's say we found only one DNA. So this DNA can be amplified by using PCR technique in which uh, in three steps, the DNA number can increase dramatically. Okay, so this is PCR, right? If we increase the DNA number, what, what happens when the DNA number is amplified, right? PCR amplifies the DNA fragment and increases the sensitivity of the DNA fingerprinting method. So it becomes more reliable, right? And the DNA fingerprint becomes more visible. So these are the steps in DNA fingerprinting method, okay? So now let us try to uh, make sense of the diagram given in your textbook. Uh, it is figure number 6.16, which is titled Schematic Representation of DNA Fingerprinting. Uh, the picture is given in your textbook, you can observe that. Now let us try to make sense of this particular picture. And let us go with the story okay so let's say a crime has been committed okay a crime has been committed and we have got two suspects individual a and individual b so we have got these two individuals so the bald one is individual a and this lean fellow is individual b so out of these two individuals one person has committed a crime and at the crime side the criminal has left a biological sample or dna sample over there and now the investigator 
he is using this particular DNA sample to create DNA profile and by using DNA fingerprinting method he want to solve the crime he want to figure out who is the criminal right now after running the gel after running the uh, fingerprinting method you can clearly see over here that uh, when this particular the DNA which is found at the crime scene is run on the gel we find these bands right after DNA fingerprinting method all those steps that we have discussed after all those steps are, are done now we get a DNA profile right so at the crime scene where the criminal has left his DNA uh, we get a DNA profile like this right based upon the uh, copy number of the VNTRs the copy number of VNTR on this particular chromosome on first chromosome number 7 is 11 right so it is near the 11 over here right and this chromosome uh, the second chromosome number 7 has got 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 and 9 so this is near the 9 right so these this uh, numbers these numbers represent number of short tandem repeats so VNTR means variable number of tandem repeats so they are variable in how many tandem repeats are there so this one contains 11 copy numbers so it, it is near 11 over here so this is near 9 and over here you can see that this now chromosome number 2 over here we have this one one two three four five six seven eight so this is near number eight this uh, VNTR is near number eight and this VNTR is number number near number six so just like that we can create a DNA profile of the uh, of the uh, criminal who has left his DNA over there now we have these two suspects and we do the same thing for these two suspects as well Right. and their VNTRs or their uh, re uh, repetitive DNA sequences will form uh, their own pattern over here different banding pattern over here right. and now we have got the DNA profiles of uh, these two individuals on this side so individual number A the bald one and the lean one individual number B on this one now what we have to do is we have to compare right. we have to compare the DNA profile of the suspects with the criminal right and if we compare we can clearly see that the DNA profile of the DNA which is found at the crime scene matches with individual number individual B right so we can say that he is the criminal okay so we can say that he is the criminal because it, it was his uh, DNA which was left at the crime scene right so that is how you use DNA uh, fingerprinting in solving crime right but in uh, Paternal testing it is a little bit different because uh, here you can see that in this particular case the hundred percent or all of the DNA bands matches over here right the criminal uh, the individual the criminals DNA matches with individual number B uh, all of the bands they match over here but in case of paternal testing right uh, fifty percent of the bands will match right because the child gets 50% from the father and 50% from the mother. So, if the DNA profile matches, 50% uh, of the DNA profile matches, then uh, we we can safely assume that the individual is the father of the child. Okay. So that is about DNA fingerprinting method. All right. But uh, before I conclude, the DNA fingerprinting method is now slowly being phased out. Right? Uh, we we have done DNA fingerprinting. Uh, we are we have done the DNA profiling based upon VNTRs because it is more convenient for us right rather than sequencing the entire genome of the individual we do uh, DNA fingerprinting by using these variable number of tandem repeats those short mini mini satellites because it is more convenient for us it is more easy rather than sequencing the entire genome but nowadays since the technology is improving the sequencing of entire genome is becoming much easier right so therefore in crime investigations now what they are doing is they are resorting to sequencing of entire genome rather than using this traditional uh, DNA fingerprinting method so that is one extra information okay so with this we have come to the end of the chapter that is molecular basis of inheritance and next we will start the new chapter chapter number seven uh, evolution okay so please read about the evolution the introductory part and uh, you can watch the next video. Thank you.